An Introduction to Theory of Knowledge by Dr. Russell A. Peterson Introduction There have been very few major works written in the field of epistemology during the past couple of decades. For the learning theorist, this has been unfortunate. The absence is quite evident as we review the writing of these theorists. How thin is learning theory when it has not been grounded on the theory of knowledge? It has not been my intention, however, to write a major work in epistemology, offering something new in theory. Moreover, I have not made any attempt to provide any historical perspective of what epistemologists over the past 25 years have given us. While questions pertaining to learning theory are to be found on every page of the book, there has not been a studied attempt to unite epistemology and learning theory. Rather, I have set for my goal a discussion of eight major epistemological problems. I do not pretend to say that all questions raised have been answered for every reader. They have been answered to my satisfaction, however. Perhaps the essence of the discussion will assist you to formulate your own answers. The first question I raise is this one. I believe that the existence of knowledge is the ability of the mind to interiorize its essence or materials. In what ways, then, can we raise questions about knowledge unless we understand the implicative values inherent in the fact of knowledge? Does this force us to begin with knowledge as a given? To do so would insist we think of the intellectual process as the embodiment of a knowledge in order to experience knowledge. Our question, then, is knowledge a given? 2. The product of thought... Is this the only means at our disposal for identifying knowledge? 3. Why do we believe that the mind is not a receptor of knowledge? 4. Why do we think that it is the will that supplies the mind with its power to think? 5. What is the science of perception? Why is its task to formulate the criteria of reality? 6. Why is it that in perception alone we are able to see why the mind uses meaning to find meaning? 7. Why does the mind find it necessary to order and provide the cognitive energy for the operant principles which direct the knowing power found in certitude? 8. What is really being implied when we say that to know means the subject has actualized its object and experienced its meaning? If there is a theory which may be, in one sense, labeled new in this work on epistemology, it would be in reference to my use of the concept experience. Is there knowledge or meaning unless the mind experiences? Is the one question which I hope will be answered for every reader. Dr. Russell A. Peterson Chapter 1. The Meaning of Philosophy the concern of philosophy is with concepts, not with things. Things become a concern of philosophy only after their essence has been conceptualized. It is through this process of conceptualization that philosophy becomes, in the words of Whitehead, the critic of fundamental ideas. To conceptualize is to bring forth ideas inherent in premises. Philosophy is the examination of premises. The quest for that knowledge of reality which explains existence in essence, but transcends both by discovering their referential meaning. With its interest in premises, there is no existent without interest to philosophy. No limit can be placed on its responsibilities. Philosophy strives to assist the learner to experience meaning, in spite of the restrictions of experience Hume wishes to place upon its role. Because of its interest in premises, philosophy is developmental in nature. This is a basic contention of Hegel. It is developmental in nature because it formulates definitions as well as develops their meaningfulness. This process permits the mind to penetrate behind appearances in order to determine the nature of reality. At each step, definitions are called for, tested, validated, or changed. In the quest for the knowledge of reality, there is the recognition that in premises lie the potentiality of value. There is another way of saying this, and Dewey gives us the clue. He says that the office of philosophy is to project by dialectic, resting supposedly upon self-evident premises, 
a realm in which the object of complaint cognitive certitude is also one with the object of the heart's best aspiration. And this is quite different from the position held by Hussle. He is quite adamant when he says that philosophy must make an absolute beginning. Farber interprets this as meaning that philosophy must make no use initially of the materials of the sciences, or of any of the assumptions of the natural view of the world. It must attempt to begin without presuppositions. This would be a good epistemological trick if it could be done, even with methods we might call deductive, descriptive, or reflective. The thinking of Aquinas is closer to our position. Philosophy, says Thomas, begins and ends with facts. Facts are the premises of philosophy. This is a strong protective measure for him. What is more logical than to premise philosophical thought on proven fact? Actually, this means for Aquinas that the most cogent philosophical question is, what is reality? This question must be answered before a fact can be actualized. To experience reality is to validate the philosophical basis of the working hypothesis. And what greater role could philosophy have than this, he asks? In an analysis of Thomistic thought on the meaning of philosophy, we find him raising a number of suppositions. These suppositions encourage us to raise a question or two about the relationship between philosophy and science. Philosophy rests upon proven facts. It also rests upon the values inherent in those facts. When philosophy seeks to know, it is searching for the fact as value, and so is science. Philosophy seeks to discover what is real. To know what is real, the mind must know the meaning of reality. Science must ask and answer the same questions. Truth for philosophy is to know the meaning of existence and essence. To know meaning is to know the nature of an existent. This is the thrust of the scientific method. Meaning suggests valuation. Both philosophy and science must concern themselves with the implicative values inherent in meaning. Perhaps what we are implying here is that science, to be scientific, must be so philosophically based, and philosophy, to be logically structured, must be scientifically based. Philosophy enables science to ask the right questions. Science enables philosophy to know what questions to ask. Philosophy is the analytical factor which provides a spiritual energy for the intellectual process. It is the essence of consciousness. The methodology found in philosophical analysis aids the mind to determine the relationship between cause and its effects. This is a rational analysis which moves on the experienced qualities of intuitive inferences. In this sense, philosophy makes a commitment to knowledge by means of the power of analytical processes, namely to function on an empirical plane. This is the only way in which philosophy can deal with reality. Philosophy starts working on the presupposition of an existent. There is something very real about a presupposition. Essentially, it becomes a dialogue between the thought processes of the mind and the revelatory powers of an object. Such a dialogue demands of philosophy the need to experience meaning. An object and its essence remains meaningless until its material is experienced. We pause for a moment to permit Weigel and Madden to summarize what has been said thus far about the meaning of philosophy. Philosophy is the thought discipline, they tell us, which proceeds from the real considered in terms of meaning, achieved spontaneously by the mind in its search of the real, to the rational erection of the hierarchical system of principles derived from the meanings achieved, in order, they say, to give the ultimate understanding of reality in as far as it is assimilable by the natural human mind. For reality to be real, it must hold meaning for the mind. To determine meaning in reality is the responsibility of the mind philosophically based on empirical premises. Philosophy is a matter of reflection. It is the reflective mind and its thought process which establishes the working relationship between subject and object, form and function, inference and consequences. It is the reflective thought process which concentrate on universals and their implicative values. 
universal truth serves as a testing ground of reflective thought. For philosophy, universal truth, the embodiment of first principles, is cause. The first step in reflective thought is a search for first principles, and only from cause can certain knowledge evolve. The goal of science is to assist the mind to know by offering supporting evidence, so what is known cannot be questioned as to its validity. Philosophy goes beyond this. Its concern is with what is known and why, as well as with what is known, the result of the learning process. Is to know the same as having learned, is the question raised by philosophy. To ask such a question is to imply that the mind must always be aware of its own reflective methodologies, and the distinction must be made between learning as a process and knowledge as a possession. Descartes tells us that philosophy has its responsibility, the unification of human knowledge. Here is the search for the universal, the identification of cause and the integration of particulars, all of which depend upon the insightful methodology structured by the mind and used to determine the essence of the knowable. Philosophy, then, as the mind of reflective thought, provides a starting point which the mind itself must experience cognitively in order to know effects. The epistemological concern of philosophy is with the propositions inherent in effects. Wittgenstein does not hesitate to say that the object of philosophy is to make propositions clear. Only in this way can thoughts be clarified. The whole thrust of reflective thought is to think upon itself in order to clarify its own processes. Man as learner. The mystery of existence is the mystery of man. To ask the question, why is there a world, is to ask, what is man? The subject matter of education is man. It is man who learns and uses the material of knowledge for his own growth and development. Man as learner is man as mind. As mind, he is a rational being capable of thought. We do not raise the questions in the same way Kierkegaard does. Supposing that we knew what a man is, he states, then we would have the criterion of truth which was sought, doubted, postulated, or fruitfully exploited by all Greek philosophy. Aristotle believes that we do not know what man is. Do we possess the criterion of truth spoken of by Kierkegaard? For Aristotle, man is the being who, when asked a rational question, can give a rational answer. In this way, man becomes a responsible being or moral subject. With respect to the criterion of truth, Aristotle wants us to remember that man is capable of responding to himself, as well as to others. Aristotle learned well from his mentor Plato. Knowledge and morality must be identified as evolving from the same source. Both men realize that they must defend the ideal of the absolute, the embodiment of universal truth. Cassier, like Aristotle, is cognizant of the philosophical debt when he says that man is a creature constantly in search of himself, a creature who, in every moment of his existence, must examine and scrutinize the conditions of his existence. The concept of man as creature is an important one for Aquinas, Regis senses his importance when he centers his position on this concept in his epistemology. To know what a man is as a creature, he says, gives to mystic epistemology its metaphysical context. But this context is not sufficient, for man is a particular creature and his imitation of God depends upon his own nature, since nature determines s. What makes man a particular creature? Cassier makes a suggestion. It is only in our immediate intercourse with human beings, he says, that we have insight into the character of man. Kant would react by saying Cassier does not carry this position far enough. Kant contends that if it were possible to have so profound an insight into a man's mental character, as shown by internal as well as external actions, as to know all its motives, even the smallest, and likewise all the external occasions that can influence them, we could calculate a man's conduct for the future with a great certainty as a lunar or solar eclipse and maintain that the man is free. By nature, man is motivated to learn. 
What makes a man a particular creature is his ability to learn how to learn. This he does together with other minds. The nature of this cognitive act makes him a particular creature. His concern is with infallible truth. Truth is an existent. His task is to discover and analyze cause in its relationship to truth. Man participates in what he learns. He judges the validity of his learning and places the value upon it. What he knows, he has experienced. Experience makes reality meaningful to him. And the origin of knowledge is the experience of reality. It is the whole man who learns. It is by means of knowledge that man becomes something more than he was. This makes him something more than being an incidental to existence. As being, he is dependent upon being for existence. Existence implies the unification and integration of mind and content. He holds the most important position in the natural order. Existence is not external to his being. He is what exists. Herein lies the being of his mind. He functions through the intermediary of objects, and herein lies the motivation for learning. The task of his mind is to understand the objects in their relationship to his being. This is a natural habit, and it functions according to an intellectual process. It is only man who can discover and formulate the laws of existence. It is a task reserved for the mind alone. It is man, in relation to the objects of existence, that brings him to the front in the development of epistemological thought. Man the knower is man the existent. He is very much a part of what is yet to be known. The power of knowing is the power given him by the mind in relation to its objects. While he is a part of substance, his mind makes it possible for him to relate parts and structure a vision of wholes. In the process, it is a matter of relating the self to what exists, as parts to be integrated to form new substance. To learn, man must be at one with the object of learning. This is what it means to possess a synthetic consciousness. In other words, man is aware of himself as an intellectual being, capable of a consciousness which enables him to probe into the unknown and discover its mysteries. His potentiality as a learner resides in his mind. He knows his mind, as the totality of the self, must belong to the object of learning. This means there must be an identification with what is to be learned. In this way, man becomes a part of what he knows. This permits him to largely determine the contents of his universe. He reacts to what he knows. It is his reaction which enables him to internalize the object which he does acts as a hypothesis to ascertain the meaningfulness of the confrontation as well as the potentialities. This requires the use of the valued judgment. It posits the belief that morality cannot be separated from the learning process. This does not permit the learner to escape the fact that the natural order is also a determiner in the whole problem of epistemology. The natural order functions according to natural principles, all of which serve in the capacity of the starting point in the human process of intellection. Content-wise, these principles must be considered as working premises of cause. While they permit the mind to function freely, they serve as a source of confrontation, the problems which must be analyzed and answered. Since the material of knowledge and its methodologies is a product of the natural order, it is therefore rational in nature. From these evolve man's motivation to learn. St. Thomas speaks of this movement when his theory of epistemology begins with man and moves to knowledge. From knowledge it moves to its content or property, which is truth. Evolving from truth, the mind moves to the characteristics of truth, which are the specifics of certitude and potentiality. Man is the knowing subject. The subject is the mind. It is the mind which knows and is a process of intellection, including the senses, memory, and imagination. As the mind comes to know the natural order and its properties, it comes to know the self. It is at this point in the process of intellection that truth awaits verification. This process tells us that all thinking is reasoning. 
and reasoning to be logical must have premises and assumptions from which to reason. Man is the subject matter, as well as the originator of the material of knowledge. As originator, he is able to transcend the limitation of self. This is the same as saying that man is his own source of knowledge. First, he is a being, and secondly, an operant, functioning through the process of intellection and its procedural perspective. The key which unlocks the mechanism of the process is the realization that the only way in which the object can be learned is for it to be internalized. It is at this point that consciousness assumes control in the learning process. Man creates knowledge by understanding its content in relation to what he already knows. The Learner as Knower Kant was confused about the implication of experience when he tells us the knower participates in the formation of experience. This participation suggests a cleavage between the act of participation and the act of experience. Participation is experience. Experience alone experiences experience. It is the knower, as the embodiment of what is, for him, that experiences meaning. To say the knower possesses knowledge is to say that he possesses the object. This does not imply that the being of the object is changed in this act of possession. This act is one of intellection, the object becoming an integral part of the essence of the mind. The object becomes united with the subject in the mind. Essentially, this is a cognitive act. It is the existential relationship between the object of knowing and the known. The essence of the object is the form which unites the knower and his object, but both retain their existentiality. The learner as philosopher. The true learner is a philosopher, and there are nine reasons. 1. He is, first and foremost, interested in cause. He knows all things have a beginning. And to know a thing is to know its first principles. 2. He works by means of the intellective process. During the use of the process, he is always asking, What values am I able to derive from reason? 3. He searches for the working principles which unite facts, parts with holes. Identification and unification are two of his perspectives. 4. He recognizes his need to understand the essence of matter its nature as well as potentiality. 5. Mind, he knows, is more than matter. It is intelligible being. He raises the question, what could be more important for us to know than intelligible being? 6. He understands the responsibilities of reflective thought and recognizes the limitations of observation. What, then, serves as objects of understanding? To answer this implies a concession to the demands of apprehension. 7. The philosopher recognizes, suggests Blackstone, that the question of the meaning of cognitive significance of a statement is logically prior to the question of either the truth or falsity or the knowledge status of that statement. Until one is reasonably clear about what is being claimed, one cannot possibly know what data are relevant to the confirming or disconfirming. 8. Philosophers make cause and effect correlative. 9. The true learner does not think in terms of mere actuality. His ideas, says Cassier, cannot advance a single step with enlarging and even transcending the term of the actual word. Essentially, then, the true learner is a philosopher because he moves on the basic premise that nothing cannot be the cause of anything. The learner as a scientist. The true learner is a scientist, and there are eight reasons why. 1. He is, first and foremost, a theorist. He projects and tests theories. These theories are the result of observation, experimentation, and perception. In looking for the past, he analyzes the present. The present he conceptualizes, and as he conceptualizes, his concern is with cause and its effects. For him, effect reflects cause. Here is where he locates his facts. He finds facts by reconstructing them and determining their dependency factors. 2. Because one fact is dependent upon another fact for meaning and relevancy, for the scientist this implies harmony in number. His search is for the universal whole as the embodiment of truth. 3. 
he is committed to the metaphysical content of knowledge. 4. The direction his methodologies carry him is dependent upon the presupposition he uses. His is the hypothesis method. 5. He has an intuition. This is not a guess, but rather a rapid, analytical, ratiosation of a synthetic insight aroused by the data already achieved. He tests it experimentally, and experience shows him to be right or wrong, says Weigel and Madden. 6. Reality for him is always on the empirical level. The theorist is the experimenter. Theory without applicative value is meaningless. As a theorist, he is a systematic and critical thinker. As experimenter, he experiences by perceiving data. He asks the questions, what are the implications of this data? 7. It is as a scientist the learner enlarges knowledge. His explanations deal with the totality of phenomena. Totality implies dependencies upon relationships. Enlargement of knowledge comes through the recognition of necessary relationships. He not only records these relationships, but he conforms to them as well. He looks for patterns among existence. 8. The true scientist, as a philosopher, makes no distinction between means and ends. He is suspicious of preconceived ideas. As a philosopher, he questions whether an idea can be preconceived. Truth is his goal. Truth is absolute but has relative values. To discover and then explore truth requires a mind philosophically oriented but empirically based. Prime values constitute the essence of the lodestar which beckons the creative mind of the philosopher-scientist. The Epistemological Premise The epistemological premise is a proposition which holds within itself a high degree of accountability to other propositions. For Descartes, the premise is an important factor in the theory of knowledge. It will be recalled that he insists we derive all human knowledge from premises whose truth is intuitively certain. This heavy responsibility which he places on intuition places him at a disadvantage when he analyzes his total epistemological schemata. Ayer tells us that what Descartes was really trying to do was to base all knowledge on proposition, which would be self-contradictory to deny. Descartes thought he had found such a proposition in cognito, which must not here be understood in its ordinary sense of I think, but rather is meaning there is a thought now. Descartes was wrong because non-cognito would be self-contradictory, only if it regarded itself, and this no significant proposition can do. A significant proposition stands or falls upon its relationship to other propositions, it is the credibility factor which must be taken into account when propositions confirm or disconfirm each other. This relationship, says Russell, depends upon principles of inference, notably induction, which are never demonstrative, which yield only probabilities and which therefore are not disproved when what they show to be probable does not happen. We disagree with this position. Premises are always formulated in the construct of precepts, this is a necessary step in ascertaining the validity of a premise. Unless premises are explicit, their meaning will be subject to arguments which are not demonstrative and therefore not valid. This means that it is necessary to validate what I call step conclusions, that is, each conclusion evolves from the preceding premise. Here, in part, in one segment of Cartesian epistemology, it is necessary to depend upon premises and their intuitive power for knowledge of conclusions. With respect to the question of inductive inference, it is a matter of believing, like Hume, that we move from instances of which we have experience to those of which we have none. It is the premise which makes it possible for us to experience what has yet not been experienced. The premise leans heavily upon intuition for assistance. There are five kinds of premises which interest us. They are, first, the factual premises. Russell defines a factual premise as that which commands a greater or lesser degree of belief on its own account, independently of its relation to other propositions. This, of course, is contrary to our definition discussed above. While it is true that the premise does command a greater or lesser degree of belief on its own account, this is true only because of its relation to other propositions. 
Propositions are not entities, and when forced to become entities are no longer propositions. Second, memory premises. Earlier we stated that premises are always formulated in the construct of precepts. The reason for this is because every premise is a memory premise. We premise what we have experienced, and memory is our vehicle of recall basic to experience. This is another way of saying that every belief is caused. The caused is the precept. Russell would have us believe that a psychological premise may be defined as a belief which is not caused by any other belief or beliefs. Our answer to this paradox is found in our argument above. Third, the problematic premise. It is Popper who suggests that if we consider one of the premises, that is, either a universal law or an initial condition as problematic, and the prognosis is something to be compared with the results of experience, then we speak of a test of the problematic premise. Fourth, the proximate premise. Price says that the proximate premise is an inductive generalization, and the ultimate premises are certain particular facts about the past, from which the generalization derives whatever probability it has, facts which are only accessible by means of memory. Fifth, a set of premises. Again, Russell addresses us. A set of premises is a minimum set in relation to a given body of propositions, if from the whole set, but not from any part of the set, all the given body of propositions can be deducted. The epistemological question. Learning is a matter of studying problems. Education begins with the problem. Every problem is the object of knowledge. One characteristic of possessing knowledge is the ability to ask the right question. As St. Thomas tells us, there is an art in asking the epistemological question. It is an art tempered by an empirically based mind. The art is one filled with epistemological dangers. The phenomenologists have learned this time after time in their flirtation with idealism. Moreover, as they continue to taste their own delicacies, the flavoring often bespeaks a touch of logical positivism. Dewey's instrumentalism, which it transcends the limits imposed upon it by James, those pragmatic in nature, fails because it does not place sufficient dependency upon presuppositions. Presuppositions refuse to permit the intellectual process to oversimplify the relationships between propositions. Propositions evolve from the empirically structured question. The empirically structured question is the one which probes into the underlying constructs of the presupposition. It wants to know if there is knowledge which is not experiential in nature. In addition, it wants to know if there is knowledge by cause. If so, does this imply that when the mind possesses knowledge, it has judged the validity of its essence? If so, what are the laws of condition? Is knowledge, then, only a consequence of something else which happens? In every epistemological question, there are presuppositions which the mind is forced to conceptualize. It is this process of conceptualization which structures the question. The question presupposes that something is to be known. The conceptualization process asks what is already known about the unknown. What experience do we bring to the experimental process? What is inherent in the object and therefore inferential in its potentiality? The epistemological question first asks these questions of itself before it moves on to take its place in the intellective process. End of chapter 1